Good Friday, hey? Good Friday. I find it hard on Good Friday not to get to Sunday because the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's the linchpin of our faith, isn't it? Like, this is the reason we exist as Christians, is to celebrate the, you know, the birth and the death and the resurrection of Christ, and that's what we get to do this week. Though there be inconvenience, okay? I get it, it's inconvenient having these masks, but better than, like, not being able to meet together, right? And don't you reckon masks have, like, an anomaly about them? Like, I'm looking out here, we've got some people with blue on the outside, some people with white on the outside. No one really knows the rules. They've got some sort of, like, magical powers that you can't do a breath check in them. Like, I don't know... You know how sometimes you have a strong coffee and you check your breath and it's bad? You'd imagine that with a mask you'd be able to do that automatically, but it doesn't work. And it doesn't work with mints either. Like, you have a mint and you can't smell the mint, but if you go into the bathroom, the urinal can get through, so it doesn't make sense, right? Anyone found all these anomalies with your masks? We've got some people with special masks where they sewed them themselves, other people refusing to put them on. It's all good. You do you. But what we're doing as a church, we've been going through the book of Romans, right? And we were thinking about taking a detour and doing just a passion narrative from one of the end of the Gospels, but when we get to where we're at in Romans 6... It's the gospel, it's the resurrection of Jesus, just fitted nicely into the book of Romans. So what we're going to do, we're going to look through chapter 6 today, and then we're going to do chapter 7 on um, Easter Sunday. So if you've got your Bibles, it'd be worth you opening them. If you don't have one here today, it's going to be up on the screen. Now, what we have seen for five weeks is Paul teaching on the grace of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be reconciled to God? Well, what it means is that Jesus came in the form of a man to bear the burden of our, you know, stupidity, essentially, so that any wall that we have between us and God can be torn down, right? How many people know that this week your actions might have put a wall between yourself and God had it not been for Jesus? Like, I know myself when I'm angry or whatever else. It offends God, but it doesn't keep me in a place of offense because of what Jesus has done, right? So we walk in the free gift of Christ. That's our big goal today. And so for five chapters, Paul has been going on. Guys, you've got to understand, grace has been there from the start. Look at Abraham. Look at David. Look at these test cases. Look at, look at life. Jesus came in order to give you life and life in abundance, and it's up to you to choose that or not. Okay, so for five chapters, he's done that. And what I reckon happens at this point in time is a bunch of larrikins walk past his sermon. Okay, so imagine Paul's preaching and a bunch of young fellas on the way to the pub or something go past and yell out this question. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, their question is like, okay, if all this grace has been appropriated to us, Well, then why not just live like loose cannons and do whatever we like, accepting the grace of Jesus Christ and live in any old way? And Paul's like, I get your question, but you've missed it. See, the gospel is not just about avoiding responsibility or a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's about life and life in abundance now. And he's saying, if you've got that attitude, you've missed the entire gospel. What you've missed is the relationship you can have with God. You know, it's not about what you do or don't do. It's about who you know or don't know. And so he says, okay, so what should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. There's a lot of final language in this passage. We died to sin. How can we live it in any longer? Don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Now, what you've got to understand, if you've been around Christian circles for a long time, this kind of language is pretty, you're used to it. But when you're listening to the gospel for the first time, you read that and go, well, what does that mean? You know, how can our death be aligned with Christ's death? And actually, that's what we're going to celebrate today. Like, on your chair, there's a little communion packet, right? Later on, we're going to celebrate what it means to participate in the death of Christ. Now, you might be thinking, how do I participate in the death of Christ? Well, what the gospel says is that all of the things that would have caused you death have been put on Christ and he died, so you don't have to. Okay, so imagine you on your worst day and imagine you on your best day. None of that contributes to your eternal salvation. 
None of it, not even your best, not even your worst. It's not about that. Okay, because it's been pinned to Jesus on the cross. So we were baptized in Christ and baptized into his death. Baptism, the phrase is about, it's, a, it, it's like, it's an encapsulation. It's like an immersion. Okay, a baptism is something that like completely overwhelms you. Now in this church, we are a Baptist church. So when we baptize crew, we push them underwater and pull them back out again. Okay, another ritual where if you're looking on the outside, why are you doing that? Well, the symbolism is that we go underwater sim symbolizing that our old life is gone. And we come out of the water symbolizing that we've been raised anew. That's all tied into this passage. Okay? Verse 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. Right? So what, what we're seeing here is these two ways to live. There's a way of living that leads to death and a way of living that leads to life. One of them is going to crush you. One of them is going to release you. One of them is going to be full of anguish. One's going to be full of love. One's going to bring you, you know, um, all kinds of destruction. One's going to set you free from destruction. And that's why we've done it. That isn't that why we get pumped at Easter? It's because we get reminded that it's not about what we've done. It's about what Christ does on our behalf, right? Okay, so now, if we die with Christ... Oh, did I skip some? Are we up to verse 5? Where are we up to here? Yeah, verse 5. So if we've been... Sorry. I actually don't like when people read and go, boop, 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 but I just did it, so I apologise for that. I will go from verse um, 8 there. So now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die again. Death has no mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives in God. Okay? So, one of the big tenets of Christianity, one of our big pillars is that we need to have faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he just died and stayed dead, there's nothing that separates him from any other God or ideology. And there's no victory over death. But what we believe at Easter is that it was the death of death. It was the beginning of eternal life. It was this transaction that happened between Jesus and his Father God that gave us access back to God. That we live with full rights, full inheritance, full like, we've learned about our standing before God. We've learned about our position before God, that you are his son or daughter, and there's nothing you can do to take yourself out of that relationship. He loves you that much. Like, I think about... I'll use Melania as an example because she's sitting here. She's my daughter. And the truth is, she barely does naughty things. Like, I, it's just a miracle. She takes after her mother. Yeah, oh yeah, maybe you're so sneaky, I don't know how that happened. But even if she started doing naughty things, it doesn't make her no longer my daughter. I'm still going to be her father no matter what decisions she makes. Because our relationship is a relationship based on, on, on blood. It's a relationship based on heritage. It's a relationship based on inheritance. There's nothing she will ever do to stop being my daughter. Same thing with Christ. If we, are, we believe that the blood of Jesus has brought us into relationship, our relationship with God then isn't about whether or not we behave or not, though that be important, right. right? It's about proximity to God himself. Like Easter, it is the reminder of what Jesus has done for you and I. Like I can't stop looking at your eyes just thinking, I hope they're smiling underneath all those masks because today is good news. Verse 11, so in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. Alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know, you were dead in sin and you're not now. Isn't that good news? Now, crude example, imagine someone you love died. You would grieve. But then magically they pop back to life. Your celebration would be off the hook. Well, that's what it's like when we look at you. You were dead in your transgressions and now you're alive. Alive in God through Christ Jesus. Alive for life's sake. Alive simply to enjoy the glory of God and see that manifest through you. <laughs> Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. 
Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under law but under grace. Hey? Sin is no longer your master. You need to hear this. When we blow it, right? It's not that we're mastered by a sin. It's not that we have a sin nature any longer. It's that we have a sin habit. That's different. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're a slave to righteousness, but every now and then you blow it. I would love if eventually down the track all of us got to a place where that wasn't the case. But for now, let's just sit in the fact that, okay, look, we're going to blow it. Okay? But when you blow it, it doesn't separate you because of what has been done on your behalf. One of, one of the best things Andrew Grant said last week, and he said a lot of good things, but he says that our death isn't, our, 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 like our eternal position isn't made up of a collection of sins so that our reversal of that isn't made up of a collection of righteous acts. Do you remember when he said that? He said it more articulately. What did you say again, Andrew? You've gotten good uh, feedback about it. How did you articulate it? Pretty much just like you said, Dave. Yeah. yeah. So our brokenness isn't a collection of horrible acts, and our righteousness isn't a collection of good acts. There's something else going on here. You know, if you can work your way into it, there has to be a line somewhere, doesn't there? And what happens if you're just above that line and just before you die, you get run over by a train and drop a swear word as you notice the train? And then you fall below the line? It doesn't work. There has to be a better path of atonement, doesn't there? There has to be a better system. And the system is that it's not about what you did. It's about what Christ did through you. Right. So on Good Friday, what happened in, in the Passion narrative is that Jesus gathered his disciples together on the Passover. Now, this Passover was a meal that was instituted a thousand years before Jesus came. Okay, when the Israelites were in Egypt and they needed to be taken out, they needed to be set free. And there was a time where Jesus rose up, or God rose up a man called Moses and said, Go speak to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and say, You've got to let my people go. You've got to let my people out of here. And then there's a series of plagues. I mean, they're pretty common. You see them in movies, you see them in popular culture. There's this series of plagues and it ends with one called the Passover. And what happens in the Passover is that they sacrifice a lamb and put the blood over the doorposts and judgment passes over their household. Right? It doesn't affect their household. It passes over and that's where we get the idea of Passover. A thousand years later, Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples and they're sitting around a table reclining. I mean, these guys knew how to do dinner, didn't they? Like, they're just laying down, if you can imagine, sort of beanbag height around a big table of food, and they're already eating. Okay? It's not the start of the meal. They've already started eating. And Jesus stops halfway through and says, Hey, the Son of Man, referring to himself, is actually going to be crucified. You know, the Son of Man, myself, is going to be broken. You know, there's a time coming where the ultimate Passover is going to be celebrated. No longer do we meet annually. No longer do we need to, you know, sit on the sacrifice of lambs or other animals. There's going to be a final sacrifice that does away with all that. And from then on, your brokenness will be passed over all the time, perpetually, as a condition. And so he sits with his disciples and says, so eat some of this bread with me. Because what it represents is my body broken for you. He's prophesying about what's going to happen in two days. And then he says, drink some of this wine. Because it represents the blood spilt for you. And then he says, whenever you gather, do this in remembrance of me. As a, as a reminder of what we've been set free from. As a reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as a reminder of what Jesus has done to make us right with God. So the Passover has a somber element and a celebration element, right? It's got the somber element because our sin cost us Jesus. But it's got the celebration element because on Sunday he came back, right? So what I'm going to get you to do is just spend a little bit of time with your crew. Spend five minutes 
Maybe you want to have a look at that passage a little bit, have a little bit of a chat, have a little bit of a pray. And when you're ready, take this. Now, if anything I've said has gone over your head, talk to the people in your group. They'll be able to fix you up. Now, can anyone... The way these things work is there's like three layers. I do apologise, they taste horrible. But luckily it's symbolic rather than anything more than that. But it does represent something fantastic. What you have to do is peel the first plastic away, and then there's a wafer, and then you pull the next plastic away, and there's the juice. Can I give you like... I'm going to give you ten minutes. Five minutes to sit with your crew and have a chat. And then in about five minutes, the, uh, the worship team, they're going to come up, sing some worship songs, and, and, and let you sit in the power of the crucifixion for a little while. So you've got freedom. So spend five minutes together, and then Alex and the team will come up. What then? Why would you say what then? It's because you want to make a decision, right? You're like, okay, I've been laid out the facts. Well, what then? What do I do with this? And he says, shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Now, a bit of context needs needing here because... When we think of slavery, right, we all go somewhere differently. You might go to African-American guys from 100 years ago, chains around their neck. You might go to child slaves over in Cambodia. Like, we all go somewhere different. When the Bible talks about slavery, it talks about the idea that you are somebody's, like, somebody leads you. Somebody leads you quite directly. And though the language be strong, it's not as bad as we project back. If you were a slave in the first century to a good master, your life was quite good. Yeah. Okay, because they looked out for you. They provided for you. There was no Centrelink or anything, so it was much better than begging. Right, if you were a slave, you worked kind of in the family. If you've ever met anyone with a South African background, a lot of the time they had people who were employed in their homes, and they took care of them. They did the gardens, they did the cooking and stuff. Like, they're not slaves, they're part of the family, but they're a submissive part of the family. Okay, good slave, good, good master, good life. Horrible master, horrible life. Passage goes to say, we all have a master. Now, we don't like this kind of language because we all want to be the master, masters of our own destiny. But what this passage is saying is that we're going to be slaves to sin or we're going to be slaves to righteousness. We're either going to be following the path of destruction in such a strong way that we call it slavery to destruction, or we're going to follow the path of righteousness in such a strong way that we're slaves to righteousness. You know, if you're a slave to a good master, your life is good. I'm happy, even if the language is strong, to be a slave to Christ, because I trust that he knows how to run my life better than I know how to run my life, right? right. And so he's, this passage goes on to say, well, what now? You know, what then shall we do? Um, we're going to be slaves to one or the other. Okay, so verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, okay, you used to be, you wholeheartedly obey the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. This is what the cross does. It, it, it changes your condition from a slave to sin to a slave to what is righteous, to you know, followers of ourselves, to followers of God, to brokenness, to restoration, to restoration. You know, I like how he says, I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. <laughs> but as you used to offer parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death, but now you've been set free from sin and became slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
What a gift. Okay, so when we're slaves to sin, we die. When we're slaves to Christ, we live as a gift, as a gift, as a gift. Right? Is anyone looking forward to getting a big chocolate bunny on Sunday? As a gift? There's nothing you need to do to earn that bunny. Somebody else is going to go out and pay for it. Somebody else is going to pay the price and give it to you as a free gift. When they give it to you, it's going to be insulting if you pull out your wallet and say, was that $6.50? Here's the money. It undermines the gift. So we can't pay Christ back for his gift. We can't pay God back. We don't even need to try it. What we need to do is put our hands out, accept the gift, and say thank you. Thank you for this gift that you paid for. I'm now going to live in this gift in proximity to God because of what he's done on our behalf. Guys, this Easter, I want you to sit in the fact that the atonement of Jesus Christ in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the atonement, the, 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 the payment that was paid is final for you as a gift. Don't try to pay it back. That just leads to legalism. Don't feel guilty about it. That just leads to like a morbid Christian life. Accept the sacrifice, accept the gift, and live out of thankfulness and be slaves to Christ. Your life will be fulfilling. You will change other people's lives because you'll represent Christ the way he wants you to represent. So my prayer for you, Good Friday is now. You've got two days to sit in the burial. In these two days, realize that when you mess up in the next two days, not if, because two days is a long time, right? We're going to mess up by 11.30 for sure, right? When you mess up, for the next couple of days, I want to picture that, I don't know, if you want to picture it like a blob, I don't know, give it a personification of some sort, the mess up, going down into the depths and dying, never to be resurrected again. And when you say those words you wish you hadn't said, apologize to the person you said them to, but realize that you're just a broken human and your words go down into the depths and die. When you're angry at that guy who cuts you off because it's Easter traffic, realize that your anger goes down into the depths and dies. And the question this passage starts with is, well, what then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace will increase? No, we don't do it on purpose. We do it because we're broken. And when we're broken, we give it to Christ. So I pray that this week... Let let me pray. Father, I want to pray that this weekend something of your truth will resonate in our hearts. God, that the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ will come alive. Father, I pray that with your death, our death has been removed. It's the death of death. Lord God, that we no longer have to live in bondage, but we can live as free individuals, Lord God, free from your, from condemnation, free from destruction, free to know that you are God, you are good, and you are our Father and you love us. Minister to our families this Easter, Lord. Show your love to your people this weekend, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's the end. If you're coming back on Sunday, we're going to be here at 9 o'clock again. Um, If you want to grab a coffee, feel free to do so. Um, Down the back there's going to be a barista for a little while. And um, enjoy your Good Friday with your loved ones, and we'll see you on Sunday morning.